Thank you very much, Katie, for the great presentation. I think hope that I can make that for the right. So um, I'm a sound artist. I'm um, a um, PhD candidate at the University of Gothenburg, as you say, and um, I will give a paper presentation specifically related to my PhD project on sound art in public space. I'm um, exploring the longitude and latitude of public space through sound art. Um, this paper addresses sound art in public space from the perspective of the artist, advocating a view of sound art as a site-specific practice that is both able to critically explore and transform a specific context, and to thereby um, constitute a vital force in the production of public space. Sound art, I argue here, makes a difference. As an artist who is specifically engaged with sound and listening as artistic media for exploring public space, I've conducted at least 20 site-specific mm -hmm. projects um, that have specifically addressed the conditions of given sites as part of longer processes of research. Libraries, parks or avenues, which can all be understood as public spaces and those as long-term complex political ideological processes have variously formed the starting point for these explorations. Temporary or permanent, mono-channel or multi-channel, each artistic project undertaken explores how sound, with its specific agency, can make a difference. Art's capacity to renegotiate what public space is and what it in turn might become forms the very core of site specificity, site specificity as a transformative practice. Um, such an approach aligned with the Deleuzean understanding of the artist as a symptomatologist and an affectologist, as uh, Anne Sauvanage puts it. A person capable of exploring and detecting virtualities within a specific context from a variety of perspectives and making those virtualities perceivable. In her now canonical One Place After Another, published in 2002, Art series Miven Kwan proposes a model of site specificity, quote, not exclusively as in <laughs> genre, but as a problem idea, as a peculiar cipher of art and spatial politics, end quote. As a political matter, understandings of space differ widely dependent on their specific political um, positioning, and written as a critique against both modernisms, the abstract and essentialized understandings of space, as well as postmodern notions of place as an idealized and constructed sphere of authenticity and loss, quant texts instead sets out the vision of sight to be understood as non polemical, as differential, and as both local and global. In this way, she attempts to overcome the exhaustion of recent decades with respect to site specificity as a critically engaged practice. As she put it, it's not a matter of choosing sites between models. Um, sorry, here. It's not a matter of choosing sites between models of nomadism and sedentariness. Between digital, uh, between space and place, between digital interfaces and the handshake. Rather, we need to be able to think the range of seeming contradictions and our contradictory desires for them together, to understand, in other words, seems oppositions as sustaining relations. Such an approach fits, as we shall see very well with imminent theory. Today, almost 15 years after Quan's incisive critique was published, there still exists an extortion that is associated with the site in site specificity. I noticed this in the discussions around my own practice and those of my peers. The transcendental polemic space place binary still hover over contemporary discourse on site specificity and the vocabulary of spatial production. And, the, one talks, and the, one, the way one talks about space impacts dramatically upon the way in which space can be imagined. Being engaged with site specificity in the 21st century means I propose operating beyond the transcendental notion of spatial production. 
This move demands um, <clears throat> the development of a vocabulary that is able to contextualize the site in site-specific practice in a manner that exceeds transcendentalism. The world is no longer a Euclidean container and must instead be understood as a complex series of interrelational, material immaterial processes of differentiation in which each single component possesses its own specific agency. From such a standpoint, a sound potentially possesses an agency equal to that of an urban space in terms of its role in the complex and heterogeneous process that we term public space. Spatial production constitutes a vital process, providing artists with a kind of echo and esological incentive to understand site specificity as renegotiation and thereby adopt an anti-essentialist approach, wherein the relation between artist, subject and world bring, brings other existing but not yet actualized fully virtual potential forces to light, producing plays as an always unfinished process. Operating in such a manner, practice is both situated and transversal. It runs through a series of discourses that are themselves understood as nodes, which are less or more connected, but which are always somehow interlinked. Drawing on the Spinozian notion of the body and Deleuze and Guattari's concept of agentement or assemblage, spatial production and those public space can be understood as the con constitution of a complex set of relations between different components and the affective forces which reformulate those relations, the spatial urban bodies, longitudes and latitudes. Such specific practice, those emerges on the one hand as an exploration of the heterogeneous and complex force relations which together constitute the assemblage that is a place, and on the other as a modification of those very relations through strategies of deterritorialization, the drawing of lines of flight, and the production of affective territories, etc. Informed by the discourse on sonic materialism, I mainly refer to Christoph Cox here, sound can be understood as constituting a non-representational phenomenon, the affected implications of which are necessarily indeterminate. Sound, with its specific agency, an ever-present component in assemblage, operates by setting airways into motion and constitutes a material, inviting to cross-referencing and varying association Sound partakes into setting up indeterminate and complex relationships. In constantly calling upon and yet always undoing processes of coding, sound escapes a rigid system of control implied by causality, instrumentality and intentionality. Sound always leaks, thereby taking on a new and critical set of implications which are tied into resistance and lines of flight. The specific agency of sound, the way in which its specific registers establish lines of life, lies at the very heart of sonic artistic practices. Deploying a vocabulary informed by imminent theory, whose outline I have now begun to sketch, the reminder of this presentation addresses an excerpt from my own artistic practice, explaining and contextualizing in a very applied manner what I term a site-specific practice beyond transcendentalism. <clears throat> the Well, from 2014. The Well was commissioned by the Swedish Art Agency in 2014. It takes as its spatial site for exploration a former private palace and its garden, which emanates from the 16th century and is situated in the centre of Paris. Since the 70s, this palace has been owned by the Swedish state. It hosts the Swedish Culture, Inst uh, Culture Institute, Institut Suédois. The public have access to the place, and the garden in particular, constitutes a regularly frequented, if not rather small, park for the locals. I was commissioned to create a permanent sound work for this garden as a contemporary contribution to the Institute's already existing collections of mainly modernist sculptures. 
To explore public space in terms of agencement or assemblage is to trace effective relations, to follow the lines which from a variety of different perspectives form places as complex pro processes. Such lines, as urban theorist Doina Petrescu describes them, constitute an abstract and complex metaphor which map a society to its entire social sphere. Quote, it is an abstract and complex enough metaphor to map the entire social field in terms of affects, politics, desire, power. To map the life, way life always proceeds at several rhythms and at several speeds. Deleuze and Guattari's agencement are made out of lines which do not measure spatial distances but forces and intensities." End quote. The ability to locate, map and contextualize the way in which such flows of desire, affect and power are organized into the lines that together constitute the assemblage we refer to as public space can, as Patresco points out, be described as a cartographic activity. Mapping the line is, in other words, about mapping agencies. What we call with different names, schizoanalysis, <coughs> micropolitics, pragmatics, diagramics, cartography is nothing else but the result of the study of the lines that we are. Such mapping takes as a starting point lived experience, the situated. To return them to the former private palace, which today hosts the Institut Suédois, I map this context in a range of ways, including multiple excursions to the place, long-standing regular contact over time with people connected to the place, careful walks in the area, and finally, research about the place and into fragments of the place's ayaxity, its thresholds of, a, of consistency as it appeared at different times in history. Together, these fragments constituted a mosaic of pictures of the place as it was observed and experienced from different angles and perspectives. In their multiplicity and relation, they open up the possibility to find a thematic point of entry and entrance. In what follows, I shall discuss a few of the lines that are traced, mapped and contextualized. The historical striations of Institut Suédois clearly denote the experience of location. Everywhere, traces of the site's history are present. That names, the names that feature in the official history of this former private palace are mostly those of famous people. My project was those conceived of as a way of letting these other voices speak, of giving forgotten people and names a kind of presence. I started to look in the archives, collecting the names of people working or living in that specific location since around 1550 mainly class people, working class people, many of whom were most likely only remembered as a name in the national deals with the way in which complex aspects of the body of the artwork modify and affect the assemblage of the place. This ladder of capacity refers to the work's ability to effectively renegotiate, decode and deterritorialize a specific spatial assemblage. Never about simply placing a finished work in a context. Such specific art can thus be described as a practice in which new connections are made between the existing components of a context. Components as understood in the broadest form as material, human, political, and the components the artist includes, inserts or finds. some picture of this shrub that turned out to be the dried well. At the Institut Suédois, I compiled the names I found in the archives. I recorded the voices of eight different actors reading around the 300 names of those who had lived and worked in the place from 1550 until the present. The dried up well acted as both a resonance charmer and as a conceptual topic for exploration. Installing a loudspeaker equipment in connection at the bottom of the well. 
Together, uh, together with a software programmer, I constructed a live-generated sound archive in a sound program, programming language, Super Collider, delivering a, an anatomic sound texture to, to the names, which always appeared in new combinations, shifting smoothly between distinct semantic textures and watery, dripping structures. In this way, the sonic material indexed on the one hand the people who once lived and worked in the place, and on the other, the well. Using the specific acoustic situation in the garden, I developed a low voice work incorporating a physical tactic listening experience in which the listener was invited to lean over the edge of the well in order to be able to experience the world. Connecting different domains, the work from those we understood not only as a, a sandwich or agencement in the conceptual sense of these terms, but also as a more concrete sense of a machine through which the distinctions between work and place are erased. Connect the archive material to the actors, connect the actors to a recording device, connect the recorded media of the archive material to a software patch and super collider. Connect the super collider patch to a purpose-built playing device. <coughs> Connect the playing device to a long cable and run it through the underground tunnel. Connect the long cable of the, to a humidity-resistant loudspeaker from which the live-generated sound texture can emanate. Connect the sound texture to the walls of the well. Connect the mix of sound textures to the resonance from the well with the audience closely listening, leaning over the, gar over the well in the garden. Connections establish affective relations that run transversely through technology, material, history, sound waves, and humidity. Together, these connections constitute the machinic assemblage you refer to as the work. Conclusion Site specificity can be understood as firstly an ability to trace the ways that specific relations form or have formed a specific site or spatial context, and secondly, as an ability to alter those relations through sound. Site-specific practice as such lies not in questions of how one should install a work, but rather in questions of how one should articulate an assemblage. Longitudinal matters, then, in such a practice concerns the specific material, historical, political and social components of a place and the way these establish different relations. Latitude, in turn, relates to an artist's ability, here my ability as an artist, to understand and to modify those relations in and through the work. In the case of the Institut Suédois, through sound in terms of effective force. That was